nor the Montana Territory. Late autumn, 1891, the Bitterroot Range stretched endlessly beneath the sky the color of iron. Snow had already dusted the high ridges, and the wind carried with it a warning. Winter was coming early, and it would show no mercy. At a remote supply post near the Clark Fork River, a group of hunters prepared for what they called the Long Camp, a 12-day elk hunting expedition deep into the mountains. Most of them loaded cast iron stoves onto mules. Others packed extra canvas, wool blankets, and enough firewood to see them through the worst of it. But one man did none of this. His name, according to local trading post records, was Alastair Crow, a fur trapper of mixed Scottish and Salish heritage, a man who spoke little and observed everything. While others stacked iron and timber, Crow carried only a shovel, a hand axe, and a short length of stovepipe. The other hunters noticed, and they laughed. You'll freeze before the first snow stops, one of them called out. That shovel won't keep you warm, Crow. He said nothing, just loaded his mule and rode north. What Alastair Crow understood, and what his critics would soon learn, was something that modern campers, preppers, and survivalists have largely forgotten. The earth itself can become a furnace, not through magic, but through physics, through a technique so ancient, so quietly effective, that it had been used by indigenous peoples and highland settlers for generations. What did this solitary trapper know about underground heat that experienced outfitters dismissed as primitive nonsense? If you've ever wondered how people survived brutal winters without modern gear, without propane, without insulation, stay with us. Because this story isn't just about one man and one stove. It's about the engineering hidden beneath our feet. Before we continue, if you find value in forgotten survival knowledge, consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell. And drop a comment below. Have you ever built a fire system that surprised everyone around you? Let's begin. Alastair Crow was not a man who sought attention. Oral accounts from the trading post at Thompson Falls describe him as quiet, methodical, and deeply knowledgeable about the land. The kind of man who could read weather in the movement of birds and find water where others saw only rock. His mother was Salish, from the flathead bands who had lived in these valleys for countless generations. His father was a stonemason from the Scottish Highlands, a man who had crossed the Atlantic with nothing but his tools and a knowledge of how heat moves through stone. Crow had inherited both traditions, and in his mind, they were not separate. They were the same science, expressed in different materials. When he arrived at his chosen campsite, a south-facing slope sheltered by a granite outcropping. He did not pitch his tent first. He studied the ground. The other hunters, camped three miles east, had already erected their shelters and ignited their cast-iron stoves. Smoke rose from their chimneys, and the smell of burning pine drifted through the valley. They were warm. They were confident. And they assumed Crow, somewhere out there with his shovel, was already regretting his decision. But Crow was not cold. He was working. He began by clearing a rectangular area roughly 8 feet by 10 feet, the footprint of his canvas tent. Then, starting from the downhill edge, he dug a trench. Not deep, perhaps 14 inches, but angled slightly upward as it moved beneath where the tent floor would lie. At the lower end, outside the tent perimeter, he excavated a wider pit, the firebox. This would be where the flames burned, concealed from the wind fed by a controlled supply of air drawn through a smaller intake tunnel he carved into the hillside. At the upper end, inside what would become the tent's far corner, he installed the short stovepipe, a vertical chimney to vent smoke and draw the heat through the underground channel. The entire system, when complete, formed a horizontal flue buried beneath the earth. Fire would burn in the external pit. Hot air and combustion gases would travel through the trench, transferring their heat into the surrounding soil. The warmed earth, dozens of cubic feet of it, would then radiate that heat upward, gently and continuously, into the tent above. This is not a stove. This was thermal mass heating, the same principle used in Russian Pechka ovens, Korean Andal floors, and the ancient Roman hypocaust. Crow had never read a physics textbook, but he understood the concept perfectly. Soil, stone, and clay absorb heat slowly and release it slowly. Unlike air, 
which cools the moment the fire dies. The earth holds warmth for hours. By the time night fell on his first day, the trench was complete, the firebox lined with flat river stones, and the chimney installed. He lit no fire yet. Instead, he pitched his tent over the buried channel, laid his bedroll directly above the warmest section, and waited. Tomorrow, the real test would begin. Back at the main hunting camp, Word of Crow's strange project had spread quickly. Among the group was a man named Elias Drummond, a former supply sergeant for the U.S. Army and a respected outfitter who had led expeditions through Montana winters for over a decade. Drummond had seen men die from cold. He had seen frostbite take fingers and toes, watch hypothermia turn strong men into stumbling wrecks. He knew, better than most, what winter in the Bitterroots could do. And he was certain that Alistair Crow was making a fatal mistake. I've seen Indians build fire pits, Drummond told the others as they gathered around his iron stove that first night. But burying a fire under your tent? That's not survival. That's suffocation waiting to happen. Smoke will fill that canvas before morning, and if it doesn't, the heat will never reach him. The ground's already half frozen. It'll suck the warmth right out of that trench. Others nodded. A younger hunter named Perkins added his own objection. And what happens when it rains? Or when the snow melts into that pit? He'll be sleeping over a mud hole. The logic seemed sound. Cast iron conducted heat instantly. You could feel it the moment the fire caught. Earth, by contrast, was slow. Unresponsive. Dead weight. Every man in that tent had grown up believing that the ground was something to insulate against, not something to heat with. What they did not understand, what Drummond, for all his experience, had never been taught, was that thermal mass operates on a different time scale than convective heating. A cast iron stove heats air. Hot air rises, swirls, and escapes through every gap in the canvas. The moment the fire dies, the air cools. Within an hour, the tent is cold again. This is why the hunters would wake at 3 a.m., shivering, to feed their stoves. This is why they consumed enormous quantities of wood, between 40 and 60 pounds per day, per tent. Crow's system worked differently. The fire's heat was not transferred to air. It was transferred to earth. Soil has a specific heat capacity roughly four times greater than air. It absorbs energy slowly, but once warmed, it releases that energy over many hours. The ground beneath Crow's tent would not cool when the fire died. It would continue radiating warmth, gently and steadily, like a stone pulled from a hearth. But Drummond did not know this. Neither did Perkins, nor any of the other hunters. He'll come crawling back by day three, Drummond predicted. If he's lucky, no one disagreed. November 9th, 1891. The storm came without warning. A massive Arctic front that swept down from Canada and collided with moist Pacific air over the northern Rockies. By noon, the sky had turned the color of slate. By dusk, the first flakes were falling. By midnight, the Bitterroot Range was buried beneath a white fury that would not relent for nearly two weeks. Temperatures plummeted. Local weather reconstructions, based on Army Signal Corps data from nearby Fort Missoula, suggest that overnight lows during the storm's peak drop to between minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit and minus 25 degrees Fahrenheit minus 29 degrees Celsius to minus 32 degrees Celsius. Wind chill made it worse. Gusts exceeding 30 miles per hour created conditions where exposed skin could suffer frostbite in under 10 minutes. At the main hunting camp, chaos erupted. The cast iron stoves, so reliable in moderate cold, became tyrants demanding constant sacrifice. The men burned through their wood reserves at a terrifying rate. Some estimates suggest as much as 70 to 80 pounds of fuel per day, per tent, just to maintain survivable temperatures. Sleep became impossible. Every two hours, someone had to wake, stumble through the dark, and feed the fire. Then the stovepipes began to fail. The extreme temperature differential between the interior heat and the exterior cold caused metal to contract and expand unevenly. Joints cracked, seams separated. Smoke began leaking into tents. On the fourth night, Perkins' stove chimney collapsed entirely, filling his shelter with carbon monoxide and forcing him to evacuate into the blizzard wearing only his long underwear. 
He survived barely. Others were not so fortunate. By day seven, two of the hunting parties had exhausted their fuel. They faced an impossible choice. Attempt the 12-mile trek back to the supply post through waist-deep snow, or wait and hope the storm would break. They chose to wait. They huddled together in a single tent, burning furniture, saddle leather, anything that would catch flame. And three miles west, in a shallow valley beneath the granite outcropping, Alistair Crow was warm. Not comfortable, perhaps. Not cozy by modern standards. But warm. His underground flu system had performed exactly as he had designed it. The firebox, sheltered in its external pit and shielded from the wind by stacked stones, burned steadily with a fraction of the fuel his neighbors consumed. Oral accounts suggest he used between 25 and 35 pounds of wood per day, roughly half the consumption of a traditional stove setup in similar conditions. But the true advantage was not efficiency. It was continuity. Even when the fire burned low, even when, during the worst of the storm, he let it die entirely for six to eight hours while he slept, the earth beneath his tent retained its heat. The thermal mass of the soil, warmed over days of continuous use, radiated energy upward like a slow-burning ember. Inside the tent, temperatures hovered between 48 degrees Fahrenheit and 58 degrees Fahrenheit, 9 degrees Celsius to 14 degrees Celsius. Cold enough to see his breath, yes, but warm enough to sleep, warm enough to survive. If you're finding this story as incredible as the hunters found Crow's design, consider giving this video a like. It helps more people discover this forgotten knowledge. And tell us in the comments, have you ever experienced a survival situation where traditional methods outperformed modern gear? When a storm finally broke on November 20th, the survivors emerged into a landscape transformed. Snow lay four feet deep in the valleys, drifted to eight or ten feet against north-facing slopes. Trees had shattered under the weight of ice. The silence was absolute. Elias Drummond, gaunt and exhausted, was among the first to reach Crow's camp. He had expected to find a frozen corpse, a cautionary tale he could share trading posts for years to come. Instead, he found Alistair Crow calmly skinning a rabbit outside a tent that was, by all appearances, completely intact. Ow! Drummond asked. It was the only word he could manage. Crow invited him inside. The tent floor was warm to the touch. Not hot, but distinctly warmer than the frozen ground outside. Crow had laid a layer of pine boughs over the buried trench, then his canvas ground sheet, then his bedroll. The heat rising from the earth below had created a microclimate, a pocket of survivable warmth in the midst of a killing freeze. Drummond knelt and pressed his palm to the ground. He stayed there for a long moment, feeling the gentle radiance, try to reconcile what he was experiencing with everything he thought he knew about heating. The empirical evidence was undeniable. Temperature differential. Crow's tent maintained interior temperatures approximately 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the exterior air during the storm's peak, without continuous fire. Fuel consumption. Over 12 days, Crow estimated he burned between 300 and 400 pounds of wood total. The main camp's hunters, using cast iron stoves, consumed an estimated 600 to 900 pounds per tent over the same period. More than double. Heat retention. After allowing his fire to die completely, Crow's tent floor remained noticeably warm for six to eight hours. The iron stove tents, by contrast, cooled to near ambient temperatures within 60 to 90 minutes of the fire going out. Smoke and air quality. The external firebox and buried flue meant that virtually no smoke entered Crow's tent. The iron stove users reported constant issues with leaking joints, backdrafts, and dangerous accumulations of carbon monoxide. These were not miraculous results. They were physics. The underground flue system worked because it leveraged the thermal mass of the earth, hundreds, perhaps thousands of pounds of soil, as a heat battery. Unlike air, which has almost no thermal mass and cools instantly, soil stores energy and releases it slowly. Unlike metal, which conducts heat so efficiently that it cools almost as fast as it warms, Earth acts as an insulator and a reservoir simultaneously. Crow had not invented anything new. 
He had simply applied principles that his mother's people had used for generations in their winter lodges. Principles his father had learned from Highland crofters who heated their stone cottages with peat fires and buried flues. The knowledge was old. The physics was eternal. Only the forgetting was new. By the spring of 1892, word of crow's survival had spread throughout the Montana Territory. At first, the story was told as a curiosity. The tale of a strange half-breed trapper who buried his fire and somehow didn't freeze. But as details emerged, as Drummond himself began describing what he had seen, the tone shifted. What had seemed like madness began to look like mastery. Local records suggest that within 18 months, at least four hunting parties in the Bitterroot region requested direct instruction from Crow on building underground heating systems. A Presbyterian minister in Thompson Falls reportedly incorporated a simplified version of the buried flue design into a mission school reducing the institution's winter fuel costs by an estimated 35%. The design was never patented, never commercialized, never written into any engineering manual. It spread the way traditional knowledge has always spread, through demonstration, through word of mouth, through the slow accumulation of trust that comes from witnessed results. And yet, within a generation, it was largely forgotten. The railroad brought cheap coal. Cast iron stoves became lighter, more efficient, more portable. The old ways, the indigenous ways, the immigrant ways, the ways of people who had no choice but to understand the land, were dismissed as relics. Primitive. Obsolete. Today, campers carry propane heaters that weigh less than five pounds and produce instant warmth at the press of a button. They sleep on inflatable pads designed to insulate them from the cold ground below never considering that the same ground, properly heated, could keep them warm all night without burning a single additional ounce of fuel. Alistair Crow died sometime in the early 1920s. No photographs survive. No journals. Only the scattered oral accounts of people who knew him, who hunted with him, who saw what he could do with nothing but a shovel and an understanding of how heat moves through the earth. But the physics remains. The earth still holds warmth the way it always has, slowly, patiently, generously. And for those willing to dig, willing to learn, willing to trust knowledge older than textbooks, the ground remembers what we have forgotten. The hunters who mocked Alistair Crow did so because they could not imagine a world where their assumptions were wrong. They believed in iron because iron was modern. They believed in fire because fire was visible. They did not believe in the slow, invisible warmth of the earth because they had never been taught to feel it. But when the blizzard came, when the cold tested every man's preparation against the indifferent judgment of nature, it was not the believers in progress who emerged unbroken. It was the man with the shovel. If this story resonated with you, subscribe to our channel for more forgotten survival wisdom from the frontier. Share this video with someone who appreciates old knowledge and leave a comment. What traditional skill do you think we've forgotten too quickly?